Hi, this is E. David Crawford, Editor-in-Chief of Grand Rounds in Neurology. Joining me is Dr. Curtis Nickel, who is our section editor for Next Generation Microbiome. Curtis is interviewing Dr. Paul Chung, who is an assistant professor of reconstructive urology at the Sydney Kimmel Medical Center, uh, Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia. He's talking about a very contemporary uh, subject and one that we in Grand Rounds in Urology have spent a lot of time with, and that is uh, the next generation microbiome, uh, next generation sequencing, and so forth for bacteria and fungus. So, Curtis, thanks for uh, the introduction coming up for Dr. Chung. My name is uh, Curtis Nickel. I am one of the editors for Grand Rounds in Urology, the infection section. And today we have as our guest, Mr. Paul Chung, who's assistant professor and director of reconstructive urology at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. Paul obtained his medical degree at Thomas Jefferson University, completed his general surgery and urology training at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, and completed a clinical fellowship in urologic trauma, reconstruction, and prosthetics at the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. Today, his talk is going to be on the next generation DNA sequencing for infected genital urinary implants. Following this, I will have a discussion with Paul on the clinical implications of his uh, uh, research. Paul? Thank you, Dr. Nickel, for the kind introduction. Uh, today, we're going to talk about next generation DNA sequencing of genital urinary implants. This is from an article that we recently published in the Canadian Journal of Urology. So, if you have any questions about uh, and need any more details, please reference that article. We know that implant infection is a feared and devastating complication. And we believe that microorganism biofilm causes and places patients at risk for infection. We understand that biofilm can be quite difficult to culture using traditional microbiology techniques. Fortunately, over the past several years, we have new techniques, which we may refer to as rapid molecular testing. And these techniques may play a role in better understanding biofilm, as well as helping to manage device infection. More specifically, uh, today we'll be talking about PCR, which uh, stands for polymerase chain reaction. Many people might be most familiar with this. However, we will also be talking about next generation sequencing or what others may refer to as high throughput sequencing. We do have lots of great articles uh, on the, the site that Dr. Nicola and others have provided uh, that may give another detail as well. Our overall aim of the study was to describe our experience at Thomas Jefferson University using molecular uh, testing for both PNL prostheses, as well as artificial urinary sphincters that have been removed for both malfunction as well as infection. In brief, for our methods, uh, implants were removed for all causes. Devices were sent within our institution for traditional microbiology culture. In addition to that, devices were swabbed with sterile gauze and sent for racket, rapid molecular testing to a lab in Lubbock, Texas. PCR was first performed on these samples after the samples were extracted. And PCR was used as kind of a rapid sc screening or what we call a level one screening. And in this type of scenario, 25 pre-identified bacteria as well as eight resistance genes can be evaluated for in a matter of hours of receiving the sample. That is the benefit of PCR. However, PCR is limited to having a predetermined sample set that you're going to want to evaluate. And it is very challenging to look at a large number of sequences at the same setting. Next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing is a solution uh, and maybe an alternative to PCR. What NGS is doing is looking at perhaps even millions of sequences at the exact same time in parallel. And rather, being, rather than being restricted to a predetermined set of microorganisms that you wanna look at, NGS uses bioinformatics to compare these sequences to a, to a um, curated database. Um, for Microgen, the company that we um, used our samples for, they have an in-house uh, curated database, which includes over 25,000 
organisms which can be identified. So in this study, um, and of course, this is our initial example, uh, our experience has improved since uh, this publication. At this time uh, of the publication, we had 35 samples, including both artificial urinary, urinary sphincters as well as PNL implants. The majority of them had been removed for mechanical failure or device malfunction, and 11 or 31 percent had been removed due to gross erosion or gross, I'm sorry, device erosion or gross infection. Um, a majority of these underwent replacement at the same setting, 74% uh, of implants. When we did this study and presented our data, we didn't look at the type of organisms in detail, and that's what we're doing at this time. As a broader example of showing what we can achieve with the technology, we wanted to look at whether the technology gave a result of, of yes or no in terms of whether an organism was present. And that's how we depicted our data in this table. We can see of the 35 implants, uh, culture actually did very well. And next generation sequencing uh, was congruent with positive culture in more than half of these. Um, for patients who had negative cultures, um, next generation sequencing was able to identify organisms that were not previously seen. So, there's a lot of use of, of uh, rapid molecular testing, and I think it falls into two settings. One would be kind of the research component of understanding biofilm. However, in this slide, I'd like to show where the clinical application is probably best fit on the forefront of medicine in the emergency room, as well as on uh, actively treating patients. And I think that really falls in treating patients with infection. So we can see of the patients who had a device erosion or gross infection that both culture and next generation sequencing did quite well in identifying organisms compared to implants that were replaced due to malfunction alone. In addition to that, next generation sequencing was able to detect additional microorganisms that were not detected on culture alone for this population. And I think one of the real benefits of rapid molecular testing is based on its name. Uh, with PCR, we can get samples within two to, uh, with on average, uh, 2.3 hours of receiving the specimen. Next generation sequencing took approximately about 4.5 days um, for our samples. And traditional culture took about 7.8 days. And I know 7.8 days may seem a little bit long, but when we look at the culture, it's not just finding out what the organism was, but waiting for the, uh, the, um, the, the sensitivities. And in addition to that, a lot of the patients who are developing infection from devices are having a polymicrobial growth. So it does take significant amount of time to allow those, mark, those microorganisms to grow as well as to be identified. And what I'd like to show you here are three examples of how uh, next generation sequencing as well as PCR can play a role clinically. In this first um, example is a 44-year-old male who had an infected penile implant. And you can see here on the left side, as uh, shown in the highlighted area, that within a few hours of receiving the sample, we can identify that the patient uh, grew a streptococcus species. And that was consistent with the culture, which took several additional days later to return. In addition to this, what's not shown is the next generation sequencing, which it, um, would show up on a separate report. However, we were able to identify additional bacteria uh, that were not identified on the culture. The meaning of these additional bacteria is to be determined uh, and will require additional work. This is a second report of a, both a rapid PCR on the left, as well as a next generation sequencing on the right. And this is a 74 year old male who had concomitant infection of a penile implant, as well as an artificial urinary sphincter. And you can see from the sample, sample of the next generation sequencing that we can identify the predominant uh, organism being Aerococcus urinae. However, you can see that additional microorganisms can be seen. Yes, these are showing up in small percents, two to 6%, and the clinical relevance of these uh, still needs to be determined. However, in this patient, uh, we were able to identify congruent uh, results compared to the eventual uh, culture. This is a third example of a 62-year-old male who had an infective penile implant. And you can see that uh, 
a fungus was identified uh, on the implant. And this is the, one of the additional benefits of uh, rapid molecular testing and next generation sequencing is that you can do both bacterial as well as fungal analysis in the same setting. Many of you have been uh, ordered, have ordered fungal tests before and you may see in your inbox that these tests keep going for weeks um, to ensure that there is no additional growth. However, with next generation sequencing, this can be achieved within a matter of days. So in conclusion, next generation sequencing and, and additional rapid molecular testing such as PCR may be able to provide a better understanding of implant biofilm compared to conventional culture. PCR as well as next generation sequencing uh, may have high clinical yield uh, specifically for infected implants uh, due to faster processing, due to the ability to identify both bacterial as well as fungal elements in the same setting. And furthermore, PCR will screen for resistance genes, uh, although NGS uh, is not evaluating directly for sensitivities. So there are a lot of uh, ways that we can continue to Im improve both the, the biofilm research as well as clinical applications of ra rapid molecular testing. However, there are many challenges uh, that we will face. Um, first is uh, how do we incorporate uh, next generation sequencing into our clinical practice? Uh, what we've discussed today is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, an additional question is, will NGS improve clinical practice? And are we gonna be able to move away from sensitivities uh, which are provided by traditional culture but not provided by next generation sequencing? Um, in brief, I do think there is a lot of benefit from next generation sequencing in the future from the results that we will learn. And I do think next generation sequencing may help us to better evaluate implant biofilm, perhaps even guiding better use of perioperative antibiotics, guiding what should we put into our irrigation solution and how should we uh, code our devices. And I think next generation, next generation sequencing will also show that what we are currently doing is very limited and that we need to think out of the box and develop novel treatments to reduce biofilm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chung, for that uh, excellent presentation and for bringing this technology to uh, us and make us aware that this technology actually exists for prosthesis and device-related infections. I'd like to ask you a, a, a few questions about your presentation that may help us see where we're going with this technology. Um, as far as cultures are concerned, for a number of years, we've been using extended cultures. In other words, five to seven day cultures to better, um, to better describe what is actually growing in the biofilm rather than the standard medical uh, microbiology laboratory cultures, which are usually 24 and at most 36 to 48 hours. Do you have any comments regarding possible use of extended culture techniques? Sure, I think that's a great question. Uh, I think uh, extended cultures definitely play a role because that's the gold standard of what we have um, today. I think from a research standpoint, that is the best comparison that we will be able to utilize with the uh, rapid molecular testing uh, for comparison results. However, our point of introducing next generation sequencing is to provide a new way to help decrease manpower, to provide more rapid results. And I do think the extended cultures have a little bit of time burden and manpower behind it. So we hope that next generation sequencing, at least in a clinical setting, might serve to be a better alternative. However, I do agree that extended cultures still need to be done from a research standpoint. Very good. Now, in, in your... Um observations, you know, noted that uh, cultures were positive more times than uh, even NGS, which is, uh, you know, next generation sequencing, which is a very sensitive technology. Do you think that that might be because of the technique you use for uh, obtaining the specimens? For instance, several decades ago, when we were doing biofilm research, long before uh, molecular biological technology was available. We were using extended cultures and electron microscopy. We found that the best way to look at biofilms on devices was to scrape the device 
with a sterile scalpel blade, then slice off a bit of the, the device, put both the device and the scalpel blade, as well as the scrapings into a media, sonicate that media, and then use that as our specimen. I wonder if you would not get a higher pickup rate for molecular techniques, PCR and NGS, if you'd use such a biofilm disrupting techniques that might work better than scrubbing or swabbing the device. I, I completely agree with you. And I think that's where the challenge lies in the yield of our results. You can see that uh, next generation sequencing uh, was only returned positive in uh, perhaps 75% uh, at best. So I do think the, the limitation of where our study is, is that we are not obtaining enough sample, as you clearly suggested, uh, from just swabbing the implant alone. Um, the second uh, issue that we have is that uh, we are needing to ship the, the sample overnight uh, to the respective laboratory. We don't have an in-house uh, sequencer that can do this for us. Uh, within the, our own institution. So that type of transport, that type of temperature uh, exposure uh, can also change uh, the quality of the sample that we're sending. I do think that uh, the scalpel technique as well as sonication uh, will lead to higher yield. And uh, I will definitely try to incorporate that into our research studies. I do think clinically though, to be able to do that on a large scale is gonna be very challenging for the regular urologist to implement into um, their scenario. And when we, a lot of other fields are using NGS, when we look at the orthopedic literature, the yields are significantly higher than, than what we're able to achieve from the implants alone. Uh, for example, with hip, hip replacements or knee replacements, they're really able to get a lot of synovial fluid and so forth, which is a very different uh, type of uh, volume of sample compared to just swabbing an implant. One of the findings that you had, Paul, was that you found positive uh, bacterial detection using especially next generation sequencing on clinically non-infective devices. In, in fact, those devices would never have been removed, were likely not painful, and were removed from malfunctioning primarily. What do you think is the clinical implications of the bacteria that you discovered on presumably non-infected uh, devices. And that is the, the, the greatest question that we can answer from this. And I think it's gonna take some time because understanding biofilm is so complex. And the question is, is biofilm bad? Uh, we don't know that. Uh, would this type of biofilm that we identified, would this have ever caused an issue for the patient is, is it walled off and is the body strong enough to prevent any type of infection from these type of findings? I do think there are, uh, that's kind of a broad answer, but I do think there are some clinical ramifications for this. Um, the first is that so we know that when we do a revision for an implant, that there is a higher risk for infection. And that higher risk for infection, we believe in part due to be due to surgical technique but also that there is a biofilm on the implant that perhaps we cannot completely irrigate uh, manually at that time of surgery. So knowing what type of organisms may be present on the implant can help us to tailor what type of perioperative antibiotics might be best, might help us to know whether we need to put a specific type of antibiotic into our irrigation solution for that specific uh, specific patient population, and may also even affect what type of coating we might or dip we might want to use for the implant that we're going to put back into the patient. And then what I'd like to highlight with all of this is that the only changes that have been made from an infection standpoint for the implant have uh, date back to 2002 and 2003, the use of inhibisome and hydrophilic coatings. Since that time, 20 years ago, we have not had any new antibiotic treatments against infection uh, for the implant besides change in surgical technique. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chung. Uh, I'd like, to, if you don't mind, to put together what I think is the take home from your presentation and our questions. Uh, the first is that I like the way that you have illustrated the fact that molecular biological techniques such as PCR and NGS, NGS will allow us to sort of discover the bacterial actors in device-related infections. 
I like the fact that um, you have presented a, a number of cases where the NGS and PCR results have changed your, the management of uh, patients in terms of uh, possible antimicrobial therapy. I believe that the more you learn from studies such as yours, the better you will be able to determine uh, perioperative antibiotics and antibiotics and irrigation, as you uh, mentioned so succinctly, and provide a, a basis for uh, device surfaces that will sort of retard and inhibit those particular bacterial colonies. By discovering the bacterial actors, we'll also be able to develop PCR panels to uh, better uh, analyze quickly the results intraoperatively. Point of care PCR appears to be the, the appropriate way to do it so that within several hours, you can see whether your pick of perioperative antibiotic and irrigation fluid was the right one, and you can change it uh, very quickly. Follow-up NGS is probably going to be important to continue to uh, correlate and corroborate the findings on PCR and to be able to better understand what is going on with these device-related infections. So with that, uh, I think we'll uh, stop this presentation and discussion but I'd like to thank Dr. Chung for presenting his ideas and letting us learn a little bit more about the use of molecular biological techniques in urologic device uh, management. Thank you.